In the name of the God of peace, amen. amen. Please be seated. I don't know about you, but I've been rather down this past week, partly because I was under the weather and because the, the illness and members of our own community have been weighing upon me in my prayers. But it's also because I've been absorbed by following the horrifying and simply heartbreaking news unfolding in Gaza and Israel. As our Bishop Marianne Buddy and Cathedral Dean Randy Hollerith wrote in a joint statement, in this moment when Israel has endured the largest slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, we must not be lazy about the truth. Their statement continues, quote, the capture and rape of civilian hostages, the slaughter of parents and children, the wanton and unprovoked carnage unleashed against the citizens of Israel is evil, and we must condemn it. This violence grieves the very heart of God, and God weeps for the people of Israel. The Bishop and Dean's statement goes on to say, it is equally true that God's heart breaks for the suffering people of Gaza. The war has claimed more than 3,000 lives on both sides since Hamas's unprecedented and un unimaginable attack last Saturday. More recently, more than a million people have been ordered to evacuate the northern Gaza Strip down to the south as if there's really space to flee. International aid groups have warned of a worsening humanitarian crisis after Israel's prevented the entry of supplies from Egypt to Gaza's 2.3 million people. In all likelihood, this week we will watch as Israel sends ground troops into Gaza. And unfortunately, this war only stokes long-standing, painful divisions between Jews and Palestinians worldwide and between countless numbers of political and ideologically polar opposites. As especially in our country, the fever pitch has grown so loud in the academy, on the op-ed pages, from city streets to family dinner tables. On the far left, there's been even some cheering and glee in response to Hamas's attacks. As Michelle Goldberg wrote in the New York Times, many progressive Jews have been profoundly shaken by the way that all members of their community on the left are treating the terrorist attacks of mass murder of civilians as noble acts of anti-colonial resistance. These are Jews who share the left's abhorrence of the occupation of Gaza and of the enormities inflicted on it, which are only going to get worse when Israel invades. I'm not an expert in any of this. I grappled really with whether even to mention all of this in my sermon. I've not had the opportunity to visit Israel or Palestine myself yet. And to be clear, no sermon can adequately respond to the complexities of the conflict and its history. There's someone with Jewish ancestry and DNA and a family name who daily, practically, is mistaken for Jewish. And as someone who seeks to follow the teachings of our Savior Jesus Christ, who himself wept over the violence in his homeland and always sided with the oppressed who experienced their own political occupation by a foreign power, I can't not say from the pulpit how Jesus preached both, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy, and blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. The Christian ideal that two wrongs don't make a right applies in every instance. As the Reverend William Barber wrote in The Guardian, I come from a faith tradition that says, even when the one you call savior is crucified, you don't respond with the tools of violence and evil action. Even when life itself is crucified, you cannot start your own campaign of monstrous forms of violence and retaliation. Now, I don't want it to seem trite as I shift from here to talk about the passage 
we've read from Paul's letter to the Corinthians as if it could possibly answer the greatest wars and conflicts of our day. But I do see a parallel about Paul's teachings of spiritual gifts and the occasion for which he was writing to the Corinthians in the first place. They relate to the real conflicts in our world, our country, and our church. So on a lighter note, allow me to explain for a moment for those who are newer to the church and to reading the Bible uh, that what we call 1 Corinthians was written by Paul, also known as St. Paul or the Apostle Paul. And Paul is one of the most prominent figures in early Christianity. Uh, aside from the Gospels themselves, he's credited with writing pretty much the rest of the New Testament. He wrote letters, or we call them epistles, to communicate with the churches that he was affiliated with to provide encouragement, theological teachings, guidance, and advice to those communities. And the Christian community to whom he was writing in this case was in the ancient city, the Greek city of Corinth. And Paul founded this community himself, and the members would have been diverse and cosmopolitan. The city of Corinth was a major trading hub, so the church likely included members from diverse social, economic, and cultural backgrounds. We can interpret the occasion that the letter is based on only from what Paul has written, because we unfortunately don't have what he's responding to from the Corinthians. But it's clear enough that they were not getting along. The church in Corinth was divided along various factions with members aligning themselves with different teachers or different prophets. I still am so, so curious about who Chloe's people are. There were also issues with the misuse and misunderstanding of spiritual gifts, particularly speaking in tongues, which was causing confusion and disorder in the church. Paul's thesis in chapter one sets the stage for everything else that the letter addresses. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. Paul's appeal for unity provides an important backdrop for his exploration of how that can still be achieved even in the midst of radical difference. While the Corinthians see their diversity as a reason to stoke divisions and claim sides, Paul teaches that the Spirit empowers diversity on purpose for their mutual good and for unity. To each person is given the manifestation of the Spirit for mutual good, Paul puts it. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, speaking in tongues, and figuring out what was said. These are the spiritual gifts he mentions here in Corinthians. But Paul also lists other spiritual gifts in his letter to the Romans. And by my reading, I only see that prophecy occurs twice. To his letter to the Romans, he adds ministering, teaching, exhortation, financial generosity, leadership, compassion, and cheerfulness to his list. So many diverse gifts equipping the people of God. But the point is that rather than seeing one gift as more important than another, is to remember that all gifts are given by the Spirit for the building up of others. It's not a gift given for yourself, but a gift given according to your natural God-given abilities to strengthen the community of which the gifted are a part. As rector of this community, I want you to know how guiding this is for me personally, how foundational it is the idea for Diana and me when we have the privilege of helping and fostering and encouraging all of us here at St. Margaret's to discover and put to use our unique gifts. Because as we say in our newcomers classes and whenever we ask for you to volunteer, it's the participation of us all that make our church what it is. Each has God-given gifts to offer back in service for the mutual good of all. Our diversity as a church is itself a strength, a strength of our unity of mission to be the hands and feet of Christ in our neighborhood, and to grow in faith and witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. People of every age, skill, 
and season of life have a role to play, as was represented so well at the ministry fair last month, all the roles related to worshiping, offering, and leading worship, all the ways we put our faith into action through compassion, ministering, exhortation. We may not call it that every week, but when we befriend our neighbors experiencing homelessness, and there's the wisdom, leadership, lived experience, and discernment of the women in our community, the queer people in our community, the people of color in our community, who challenge us to draw the circle wider, learn from our mistakes, and build beloved community. And there's so many of you who share your gift of financial generosity by funding the work we do to change the lives of so many. As we celebrate this rich tapestry of gifts and talents within our congregation, it's essential we recognize not only the potential, but also the responsibility that comes with these gifts. Paul's occasion of responding to the disunity among the Corinthians reminds us of the worst that can happen when disunity grows so extreme as to become violent conflict, as is playing out in so many parts of the world now. We are called to be peacemakers and agents of mercy, not only within our own walls, but outside in the world beyond these doors. Paul's words about spiritual gifts remind us that diversity strengthens unity, and our unity empowers us to make a difference in the face of conflict and division. As we draw inspiration from these teachings, I'd invite you to consider some practical ways that we can respond to these conflicts, particularly in Israel and Palestine. First, if you've not yet done so, and you do know people, Jewish, Palestinian friends, reach out to them. They are not okay. You may think that you don't know what to say, but simply saying that you're thinking of them and asking how they are and then being prepared to listen to the response is not to be discounted as your first action. Second, support humanitarian efforts. Donations to reputable aid agencies can provide much needed relief. I've made two donations from my discretionary fund. The first was to the American Friends of the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem which operates schools and hospitals and programs for at-risk children in Gaza, as well as a number of other places. And the second was to an effort my Jewish colleague and friend whose parents live in Israel recommended. It's called Isra AIDS Emergency Fund. They're coordinating housing for evacuees from the Gaza border region and helping provide mental health care. I can provide the links to these places for anyone who wants them. Third, encourage open dialogue and understanding. Seek opportunities to engage in constructive conversations, especially with those whose opinions differ from our own. Dialogue is a path to reconciliation and peace. And I think a subset of dialogue is to be well-educated, to educate ourselves, understand the history, the root causes of the conflict, the experiences of those affected, seek knowledge from both sides of the issue, Knowledge is a powerful tool. And finally, advocate for peace. In my opinion, it is possible to support Israel and Palestinian liberation and still call for an end to violence. Reverend Barber also called on the wisdom of his enslaved ancestors when he wrote, pass down to me a resolve to organize even more feverishly nonviolent resistance in the face of injustice and oppression. Our Christian faith calls us to act for peace. Use your voice to influence and advocate for peace and nonviolence. This can involve writing to elected officials, participating in peaceful protests, and supporting organizations that are committed to conflict resolution. In our pursuit of unity and peace, let us remember the words of our Savior. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. May these teachings guide our actions, and may our diverse gifts as a community be a force for healing, reconciliation, and common good throughout the world. Amen. <laughs>